ask you to kindly. Um, I'm so excited for many of you to be here today. I know that we have such an, a very engaging conversation. I know many of you here um, are tuning in from different parts. So we'll just take a, a few seconds to actually, um, you know, introduce yourself. So please put your name, where you're, where you're tuning in from, and why you care about the insurance industry or what your concerns are when it comes to the climate crisis um, if you want. So feel free to just type in where you're um, zooming in from to just let us know um, where you're from. And we also will have the question and answer Q&A box below. Um, you'll see it on, on your screen below. So if you have questions and answers, you can also ask that. And just to reconfirm, this webinar is being recorded. So if you do not want to see yourself um, on the Zoom, I recommend to turn off your, your webcam. And you can also access the, the digital webinar screening um, in the next few weeks. Um, and thank you so much, everyone who has just tuned in. We are going to get started very shortly. Um, I am the moderator today. Um, my name is Isaiah Fernandez. So if you hear me speaking a lot, that's just because I am here <laughs> to moderate this conversation. Um, and I'm very excited for everyone here um, to do that. Uh, thank you so much for those who have contributed to the chat. Um, and we're, I think we're ready to get um, started a bit. Um, maybe we can get the slides up on that end then, um, since everyone now is tuned in. Thank you so much again, everyone, for being here today. I am collaborating today here with Insure Our Future to talk about how insurers are feeling the climate crisis and how we can stop them. I know for many of you probably have the expertise in this industry or some of you do not have the expertise or have been invested. Um, I, am, I am your moderator today. I will go to the next slide, please, um, on that end. Um, so. We have such a great lineup today. Um, a brief intro about me is I'm the moderator today. My name is Isaiah Hernandez. I am a climate media creator. Um, a lot of my work focuses on improving environmental literacy for marginalized communities and working alongside institutions, foundations, and nonprofits to help accelerate the climate crisis today. Um, we have such a great speaker lineup. We have Layla Larby, that is our senior campaign manager at Ensure Our Future. We have um, Friday and Future Uganda Youth Activist, um, Helda Flavia Nakabuya, and she is an activist and campaigner. And we have Louise Pryor, an actuary that has the inside perspective in the insurance industry. Um, and she will be speaking alongside on that end. Um, and yeah, I think for me, the reason why I've partnered up with Insure Our Future is that a um, few years ago um, with wildfires increasing here in the United States, um, a lot of people were asking me about ways in which they can advocate for insurance policies to become more just. And to be to be quite frank, I didn't really know much about the insurance industry and how it was connected to the climate crisis um, on that end. So when I actually looked more into the insurance industry and how it's actually entangled with the fossil fuel industry and other in exploitative industries, that really got me to start to think, OK, there is something wrong on this end of what's happening. Um, so that's something that I recognize um, on myself. And yeah, I think I want to get into the next slide to maybe give you all maybe a brief demo of what got me into it and how I use climate media to really communicate that um, on that end. But I want to, yeah. Company announced it will no longer insure new homes and properties in California due to. Well, we, I am not surprised that corporations are not doing what they want to do to protect people. But this is just really sad to see this because I know so many friends who have lost their properties in wildfires in both Northern and Southern California. I mean, one study showed that in 2022, to repair around 20 homes costed around $530 million. And it makes you think, what if that money were to go to climate resilience solutions to ensure that people don't lose their properties? I mean, even in 2018, when I was living in Northern California, they had the hugest wildfire and that costed $148.5 billion in this economic damage. So of course, corporations are seeing this as economic profit loss, but it also means that we are at an age that we can no longer even rely on these quote unquote insurance companies to protect us in California specifically. 
we need more climate adaptation strategies and mitigation because people are going to continue losing their homes as the climate crisis continues to worsen. I mean, for me, I can't even buy a house so in California. So, I mean, there goes my idea of trying to own a home here. So the video in question was actually produced almost a year and a half ago. Um, we have very strict policies in California when it comes to insurers. So I actually found out more about these companies and how things are working from the legislation process to the own corporate internal policies that they have. And so it seems that there's an internal battle right now happening in California with the government, but also these corporations of saying like, who's going to help subsidize and who's going to help provide these types of um, extra funding for these um, homes that are being destroyed. And so this actually got a lot of my community speaking about whether or not they should buy properties in mountainous regions, which anyone who's been to Southern California or knows about California, we are largely prone to wildfires due to the climate crisis and the exacerbated um, heat waves. And right now what we're seeing California doing in, so in Southern California, like Los Angeles, is that they're trying to build more housing in mountainous regions, which is a huge fire risk and a huge danger um, because of a lot of zoning laws in urban areas that do not permit for more buildings to be built. Um, they are building more upward. And so this was kind of a conversation to bring on that end. And we'll go to the next slide um, before we get to our amazing speakers on this end. Uh, I'm putting it now. I think maybe, yeah. So this is just kind of an example of how I really use climate media work today on my platform, Queer Brown Vegan. It's really focused on really um, extrapolating a lot of that information. I know I don't have the other slides um, on there, um, but if you're really interested in learning more about just a general introduction of like how insurance companies are failing us, I really recommend you to read this post. It takes maybe less than 10 minutes to read or five minutes. Uh, it's a really great introduction uh, to that on that end. Uh, we'll go to the next slide on that end. So just a reminder um, for you all is that the first ever Global Week of Action targeting the insurance industry um, is happening from Monday, 26th of February to Sunday, 23rd March. So uh, make sure to head over to insureourfuture.com, I believe, or .org, .com. Um, and you can also uh, make sure to use the hashtag insureourfuture and tag us at Insure Our Future to make sure that we're seeing that, um, whether that's on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, Threads, Instagram, uh, TikTok, use your platform to raise awareness um, on this and you can find out much more uh, great information on that end and understanding how insurance underpins most commercial activities and understanding on that end. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, will we share the slides and links afterwards? Yes, the I think I believe the Insure Our Future will share the webinar, and I think they will share the slides on this end. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful question. And please remind you all that you can use the Q&A box, so please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation on this end today. Today, our first amazing speaker is Helda Flavia Nakabuya that is taking on the world leading insurance companies to stop e -E -A -C -O -P. Um, I am so grateful to be in her presence today, and I would love for her to introduce herself and share a little bit more about her work and um, what she's specifically going to be focusing on um, to help stopping insurance companies um, in the Global South. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hilda Flavia Nakavia. I'm a climate and environmental rights activist. I'm based in Kampala, Uganda. I work with Fridays for Future Uganda. And for the Global Week of Action, I'm working with uh, Ensure Our Future. I come from a village in Masaka district in the south of Uganda, next to Lake Victoria. And growing up as a child, I always witnessed the effects of climate change on my community from uh, from heavy rains to strong winds uh, to rising temperatures that would dry our crops. I come from a farmer's background. So our plantation or our field or our garden was um, everything to us. And anything that happened to our garden would affect our lives directly because that's where we would get our food. That's where we would get yields to sell and get money for medication, for uh, tuition fees, and any other uh, needs of money. So growing up in this lifestyle, in a farmer's background, and having experienced heavy rains and strong winds on our plantation, 
it gave me uh, a picture of by that time what I didn't know in my head, which was climate change. I didn't know climate change was real. So I just realized, uh, I just noticed that our plantation was uh, being bent and broken by strong winds. Our crops were drying because of the rising temperatures. Our wells, where we used to fetch water for domestic use, were also drying up because of these high temperatures. And there was uh, seasonal changes, which made it really hard to predict. And if you cannot predict seasons, if you're a farmer, that's the biggest challenge because then you don't know when to plant or when to grow, when to harvest. So it really made it hard for agriculture to thrive in such an environment that is affected by climate change. I vividly remember one day when it rained and I thought it would only stop that day, but it rained consecutively for three days and uh, our roads flooded. So it really made it hard for us to go to school. I sat at home for quite a number of days as other kids went to school. And this made me think of what, uh, what is happening elsewhere. And uh, when our plantation got devastated, I asked my grandmother, what's happening? He told, she told me that gods were punishing us, but I didn't know. I, I couldn't uh, fathom why the gods would punish us, yet we haven't done anything wrong. So I learned about climate change when I joined university. And since then, I've been working with various uh, non-government organizations, uh, CBOs, international organizations, that are in line with demanding climate justice. And that's what I'm doing even up to now. So the Global Week of Action really means a lot to me, uh, especially now that my community is being affected by the East African crude oil pipeline. I, I request to share the picture of uh, the East African crude oil pipeline so that people, yeah. So that uh, red line you see is the pipeline. It will be the world's longest heated crude oil pipeline. It will be 1,443 kilometers long if it's ever built. And you're seeing Total Energy is there because uh, Total is the lead um, company for this pipeline. It's the one pushing for this pipeline to be constructed in my country. For us, this pipeline is a climate bomb because it's affecting people. People are being, uh, people have already Actually, they have already been uh, sent off their land. They have been displaced, some of them even without compensation. And it's affecting nature because people's land is being taken. Their gardens are being cut down. Trees are being cut down. Forests are being encroached. Uh, swamps uh, are being encroached. The pipeline passes over uh, through over 200 rivers and as you can see on the map a third of the pipeline passes through Lake Victoria water basin. Lake Victoria is that middle uh, lake uh, that is really huge. Lake Victoria is um, a very significant water resource because it's the second biggest uh, freshwater body in the world and it's also the source of the longest river Nile. So all this water resource, all this nature will be affected if the East African crude oil pipeline is constructed. And of course, the climate, because right, uh, right now they're into exploration part of it, of the oil. And even the exploration part, part is producing a lot, of, uh, a lot of emissions, a lot of carbon. So research shows that when the explore, exploration uh, process is happening, and if it, when the pipeline is constructed, the, uh, the, the project will emit over 32.3 million metric tons of carbon per year. But then this amount does not even include the emissions from the transportation and the processing. So there are even more emissions to be emitted from this pipeline, if at all it's, uh, it's successful. So, why I'm joining the Global Week of Action is to ask and demand insurers that are interested in supporting the ECOP and even those that are not to stop funding such fossil fuel projects uh, like the East African Credo Pipeline. Uh, many insurers like Zurich uh, have shown interest in supporting ECOP, but now Zurich dropped out. But there are others like Tokyo Marine, 
uh, Lloyds of London that haven't dropped out of ECOP. So my main focus uh, will be to demand insurers like Lloyds of London, uh, Tokyo Marine, uh, to stop uh, their support for the East African crude oil pipeline project, but even also other projects, other oil and gas projects that are going on around the world, like the LNG in, uh, in the US and many others. And we are not only focusing on, uh, on, on Tokyo Marine and Lloyd's, but there's also AIG. And you can also look through your community what insurance companies are creating havoc or are insuring fossil fuel projects. And then you can aim to reach those, uh, those insurance companies to demand that they stop that. Why? Because insurance companies are supposed to protect us, the communities, but now they are protecting the fossil fuel companies, which is not fair. So we need to remind them of their responsibility to the communities because uh, overall uh, they are paid to protect the communities from havoc. But because they have been ensuring fossil fuel projects, that means they have been uh, doing the opposite. So we need to remind them of their responsibility. And that's why I will be joining the Global Week of Action to ensure our communities. Uh, this is a picture of uh, one of the campaigns, um, the rallies that we've been doing in different communities with the Stop Eco project. Uh, we've reached out to different uh, people and communities uh, that are affected by the pipeline and uh, creating awareness about what is happening, the effects of the, uh, of the project, of the eco project to them and what they can do. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'll wait if anyone has any questions at the end. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you so much, Hilda. And that was such an amazing presentation. And I actually do have a few questions. And for those who do have their questions, um, there will be a Q&A actually. So feel free to uh, submit your questions on the Q&A box or submit it on the chat. We will record it. Um, you know, Hilda, I think that you did, you did so eloquently to be able to connect how fossil fuel projects and the insurance industry are, are tied together. They're like siblings themselves, you would say. Um, you know, one of the things I, I guess were for us that maybe are not not in those countries is like, how can we from like global north countries um, continue to pressure these these corporations to stop doing it? And the also the other question I kind of wanted to ask you, too, is, um, you know, what some of the risks that activists in, in, in the global south right now having to take to go against these insurance industries? and why it's so important for all of us here to kind of raise awareness on one, the, the campaign, but two, that these are similar things happening. Like you said, LNG that's happening here or Stop Willow in Alaska. We, we are facing the same issues here in, in our country too, but in, in the global South, we don't see as much media attention happening. So how do we continue to amplify and help the, the, the campaigns that you're running against? Uh, thank you for the question. So we've been using different ways of reaching out to people, uh, uh, such as social media, which is the easiest <laughs> that everyone can be a part of. So we've been using social media in the, like you can see on the screen, while we mobilize people in different parts of the world to stand with us, uh, to stand in solidarity. You can write your message in a placard, take a picture, share on social media. You can record a video uh, of what you want to communicate or what you uh, demand uh, it could be from uh, it could be uh, a message directly to uh, fossil fuel companies that causing havoc in your community. Uh, it could be to an insurance company, for example. It could be to policymakers. Uh, it could be to decision makers. So, social media is one of the biggest tools that we do, but we also mobilize in communities because communities are on the front lines. They are the ones that are being affected by this project. So we reach out to communities, mobilize them, sensitize them, organize trainings, make sure they are well informed so that they can be, so that they are empowered to also speak up for themselves. And uh, another thing is we've been reaching out to uh, different uh, decision, no, different influencers uh, globally. For example, for the Stop Eco campaign, uh, we have had um we had a 
we joined a match that was organized in Paris. Uh, it was the Paris Climate March. We took part in this match and we created awareness about the pipeline to different people who participated. We also had a rally within different European countries uh, just to create awareness about the eco pipeline so that people can stand in solidarity with us, but also because Total is a French company. So we needed uh, French people to know what is happening in our communities and uh, where where the, the energy they're using comes from, uh, where the oil that they're using comes from, and how it's affecting the people in these communities. So we created awareness by joining such um, marches or climate strikes or climate protests. And uh, we also reached out to influential people such as the pop, like you you saw in the, in the old slide, to the pop, to uh, uh, presidents of uh, different countries uh, to banks, uh, banks and other financial institutions where that give support to Total Energies, which was uh, the biggest uh, our our target company. So we reached out to these financial institutions. We reached out to Total's uh, financial advisors to share the plight and the stories of people on the front line, so that they can draw from our experience to better advise Total Energies on uh, its, its desires or the projects that it's, uh, it's operating in other countries. So that's how we've been able to reach out to different people and also to reach uh, where the campaign is right now. And yeah. at the moment, we over 25 banks have withdrawn their support for the eco project and over 26 insurers also have withdrawn their support from this project that that is so amazing hilda and thank you so much for showcasing those that we can constantly target from even being a frontline activist to even divesting away and cutting your relationship with those industries i know that here in the United States, a lot of people I know have Chase, and I've been pressuring a lot of my friends to abandon Chase uh, for its 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 contribution to the fossil fuel industry. And I think it is very powerful to see that you actually are able to maintain pressure on these um, companies for them to actually have to drop out. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much again for just sharing us this information and how we can continue working together to stop EACOP because we, we need to do that. So I, I just want to say thank you so much, Hilda. And for those who have questions, um, we will have um, time to ask more questions to Hilda and her amazing work that she continues to do um, in this industry. And you can see all the campaigns and the activism that she continues to do. Um, please make sure to check out her work and also message her if you're interested in getting involved with the campaign. Um, and I think we should have, we'll have time to go on to the next slides, please, I think. Great. Um, so for our next speaker, as we kind of got an overview of the industry of, you know, first of all, we're, we discussed the role of the insurance industry in the climate crisis. And now we kind of understand this, like, an overview of, okay, so now we know how fossil fuels and insurance companies are working together to kind of create this system of, within the climate crisis. But how can insurance industry be a catalyst for change? And that's something that I often ask myself and my community ask themselves, which is why I'm very excited to introduce um, Luis Pryor, who is an insider perspective on the insurance industry's roles and their responsibility in the climate crisis um, I thank you so much for being here today, Louise, and feel free to introduce yourself and the work that you do. Thanks, Azaz. It's great to be here. Um, I don't think, yeah, I was going to say, I don't think we need the slide now. Um, so I'm an actuary. I'm, um, I've been focusing for at least the last 10 years on climate issues because I think it's the most important problem facing us as, as people, as the world. And because I would really, really, really like to see the financial services industry actually serving society rather than just their own interests. Um, so um, I have been working with my professional body, the uh, Institution Faculty of Actuaries in the UK. I've spent a lot. They, they actually do some pretty good work on sustainability. There's a um, 
they have a lot of resources for people on some of some of what's going on. Um, and I'm a, also a past president of that. I'm currently chair of the Ecology Building Society, which is a small mutual bank for, 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 for non-Brits. Uh, building Society is a mutual bank, so we're not profit making. Well, we do make profits, but it's all plowed back. And we're really, really focused on lending for impact. We want to make the world a better place. So that's what we lend for. But I've done a lot of work, a lot of thinking about the role of insurers in, in the climate crisis. And we see in our everyday lives, we see insurers because they insure our homes, if, if we live in the right place or our cars or whatever. But that's actually just the tip of the iceberg of what insurers do. Insurers, they like to think of themselves, and I, th I think it's reasonably accurate, as if you like the lubrication for the commercial world. It's insurance that helps a lot of economic and commercial activity take place because insurers manage, help, help, help um, corporates manage the risks. So what insurers, how insurers can be really, really impactful is in what they insure or what they refuse to be insured. So for example, they have historically, they've had quite a lot of impact on building codes because people haven't been able to get insurance for buildings that don't meet code because, um, you know, because insurers think it's too risky. So if insurers think something too risky, it quite often stops happening. So that's why insurance is really, really important. You know, and I, I really appreciate that because I think that kind of helps illustrate the ways for the next question, but also the ways that insurance industries are thinking, which is, you know, the main risk that, you know, these, in these industries identify on with the regard to climate change, like, how aware is the industry of these risks? I know that often at times it seems that like they are trying to be aware of these risks, but I think it's all about more about profit loss than actually holistic view of ecological and social and economic impacts. Uh, yes, uh, profit is very, very important to insurance companies. That's what they feel they're there for. Um, they are very, very aware of the short term of risks to themselves from climate change, because that's they have to be in order to manage their company. And the insurance regulators around the world are telling them that they have to worry about climate risk. But climate risk is the risk in this context would mean the risk of the insurer failing and therefore the policyholders um being stuck without insurance. What insurers don't do is they don't think so much about the big picture. Um, some of them do. Um, uh, nearly 10 years ago, well, about eight, eight or nine years ago, um, the boss of AXA, one of the possibly the biggest insurance company in the world, said that um, a four degree world will be uninsurable. Um, so that has been that that concept has been in circulation for quite a long time now. And what he was saying is that if climate change continues the way it is, then our industry, the insurance industry will cease to exist. Now that to me, to the insurance industry should be considered a huge, huge risk, but it's so sort of big and existential that they're not thinking about it. I don't think nearly enough. Yeah, and that's interesting. You said like how even I mean, even a decade ago, right? We already yeah. were seeing larger impacts of the climate crisis, and this kind of re revolves back to the next question: is like, so why is it that insurance companies continue to insure fossil fuel projects and oil and gas expansion, but they don't really prioritize the clean and renewable energy industry? Or if they do, it's small investments of those investments going in to insure those industries. Yeah. So someone's just said in the chat a single word answer, capitalism. And, and you know, I, I can't disagree. I, I really, I, that is so right. It's short term profits, basically. Um, they have, uh, most of them are um, uh, 
shareholder companies. Um, I don't think there are any really big mutuals left nowadays. There used to be some mutuals, but they mostly demutualized. Um, and it's short term profits. And it's also, I think, so I'm, I can stand here today and I can tell you and I can tell other people and I do spend quite a lot of time doing this, that look, there is going to be an immense amount of change over the next five to 10 years um, in, our, um, in the economic world, in the financial world and in society, because either basically we get to grips with, with climate change, start having uh, move to a low carbon economy, have an orderly transition. But that means huge changes. Of course it does. Moving to a low carbon economy, you know, isn't isn't just doing the same as we do now. It's it's doing different stuff. So that's going to be huge changes. And if we don't succeed in doing that, we then have um, either a disorderly transition when things go horribly wrong and we end up in a low carbon economy at the end of it, which would be kind of better than nothing. Or the worst case, when we just don't do anything and things just carry on, except that things won't carry on because the climate will continue getting worse and it will have bigger and bigger impacts. So basically, business as usual is not an option, right? You, you can't. It's just not going to have our lives in 10 years time are going to be very different. I can't tell you how in what way they're going to be different, but I can tell you they're going to be very different. But um, insurers like all the other big corporates. I know of sort of plan for the future and think for the future. A, they don't think actually that long term. And B, they think of the future as just being a minor perturbation of the state we're in now. And that's wrong. And it's just wrong. And it's just not a good way to plan. So it's this short term outlook that is isn't isn't letting them think about, well, look, we're doing stuff now. We're financing these oil pipelines. We're financing fossil, fossil fuel extraction. We're financing exploration. That is going to put out of, us out of business in 10 to 20 years' time. That's going to destroy our industry. And why aren't they thinking like that? I don't know. Well, I have some ideas, but like capitalism. But, you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's not a very constructive way of thinking, to my mind. Well, you know, this goes back to even a deeper question, like you were saying, like we cannot re we cannot resume the same business as we are today. And as the climate crisis gets worse, right, we know that, you know, sooner or later, people won't be able to afford insurance rates because the rates are so high. And then the and right, that's what we're seeing here in the United States right now in California, where I'm from, where the insurance companies are blaming the state government because the state government's not giving them um, subsidies or they're not giving they're not giving more money to meet those rates. So then they are having to increase it. But then homeowners are the ones who are getting um, essentially mm. left because they're ones like, oh, well, we can't mm. afford it anymore. So this question actually um, I, I wanted to ask next is like, you know, how what is the impact that it's going to have in the future for this industry? Like financially, do you see it like essentially blowing up where the government's going to have to step in and say you, there needs to be a cap of how much you can give rates to insure to people that want insurance? Do you think that? in itself, you're going to see a new industry emerge from that. Um, I, I'm very curious because I think obviously we have the same issues in, in our in our respective countries. Yeah. I don't think anyone can actually force insurers to write business. Um, basically, if you try and regulate rates, insurers will then say, well, we're just not going to write that business because we can't make a profit on it. And, you know, there we are, capitalists again. But the money has to come from somewhere. I mean, if you say, well, insurers, you have to insure such, uh, you know, this risk, you're only allowed to charge this fairly small, reasonable premium, uh, but you've still got to pay out on all the losses. Where's the money going to come from to pay out the losses? Because the insurers won't have it because their premiums will be too low. So I, d I don't think that just regulating rates is 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 actually going to help anyone unless the people doing the regulation are prepared to put their money where their mouth is and saying well look actually we the taxpayers will be the insurers of last resort um and tax tax well politicians aren't that keen on committing taxpayers to pay for things 
But that's what's happening at the moment now, certainly in Florida, certainly in California to a certain extent, certainly in, in the UK to a certain extent with um, our um, flood insurance program, Flood Re, is that essentially it's the, the taxpayers who are going to be on the hook. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, when push comes to shove, how well is that going to go down? Yeah, and then we'll definitely see more inequality continue to rise. I know U.S. it's very apparent now how yeah. much inequality exists in our yeah. system today. But you know, this kind of ties into this next question that was actually from the audience: is that um, you know they really appreciate where you're coming here from today, and you know your perspective. Where do you think we can find allies in the insurance industry, such as particular roles, organizations, groups, companies? And do you have any pearls of wisdom that you would teach them and embolden them to enhance their strategies of how they message? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, there are people within individual insurers. Um, they mostly have have um, sort of sustainability teams now. And mostly what, what you find, you know, talking informally to people, what you find is that the people in those sustainability teams are really, really trying to apply quite a lot of pressure. But they're kind of doing it from below, if you like. And it's it, it, the, the way to, I think, really get change in the insurers. Um, you can get it to a certain extent from regulation and legislation, but that's very much compliance driven rather than genuine wanting to do stuff. You know, they'll do it because they're told to. But what really makes a difference is leadership from the top. So if you've got a CEO or a chair who absolutely gets this. And how can how can we get that to happen? I'm wary of saying that what we have to do is to make them realize what the real problem is that they're putting themselves out of business. Because although that's true, I know that rational arguments aren't necessarily the way to to make change to push change which i find very difficult because i'm a rational person or that that's sort of my way of that's my mindset so somehow we have to get people to realize i mean is it a good look for insurers for example to facilitate and enable disruptive actions like crude oil pipelines through africa while they are refusing to support mundane everyday actions like living in a house i mean that just seems crazy why don't why don't you spend money on you know why don't you try and help people live in houses rather than help people destroy the ability to live in houses it's the ongoing contradictions that these companies continue to hold but the large confluence of power that they've upheld in the system and how much they've been yeah. treated and reprimanded. And, you know, I think, you know, this is kind of like my question to you is like, have you seen in your lifetime of insurance industries attempted or be held accountable for certain disasters? Or I would, what I want to say is more like for failing to take action. Do you think there's a legislative way to take them to court just as fossil fuel companies are, are trying to be sent to court to? The trouble is, I think it would be very, it, it's such a long causal chain that there's no sort of direct action. There's, you can't say, well, if that insurer hadn't insured that project, it wouldn't have happened and the disaster wouldn't have happened because surely, I mean, any insurer would be able to say, well, actually, it, we were only watched. These, these big, big things are, are never just one insurer to start with, the, the, you know, consortia and so on, and somebody else would have stepped in. I mean, I, th I think what I'd say to the, my message to the industry is why are you trying to put yourselves out of business? Um, maybe that's something that can get through. But it's uh, I. I'm sorry, I'm not sounding I'm not sounding terribly constructive here because, kind of, you know, if I knew the answer, I would have done it already. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the hardest question when we know at the end of the day, like the, we can, as much as we disrupt their private conferences and their meetings and whatever they're they're having, it's like, it seems like an endless um, battle here. I mean, here in the United States, we, we are trying to, which is why it's so important for all of us collectively to try to find that solution by mm. 
checking out mm-hmm. into our future campaign and what we're doing there because you know although we realistically are dealing with the same issues just in different contexts and different ways of how it's being constructed or viewed as from its citizen point of view uh, we do need to take action on the end. So I really appreciate all the comments of people leaving here um, below. And if you have questions for Luis, we do have Q&A. So we will definitely have more opportunities to do that. So please submit your Q&A on the Q&A box. We will definitely be extending more of this conversation today. Um, and so thank you so much, Luis. Um, and thank you again for everything. And we're going to go to our next speaker. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please, if possible, or open up the slides again. Um, our next speaker will be Layla Larby, who is people's power of how your online and offline actions do make a difference. And I'm so excited for you to join us here today, Layla, if you can briefly introduce yourself and maybe talk about, you know, when did you learn about the insurer's role in the climate crisis and what led you to campaign around insurance? And doesn't it doesn't seem like the most obvious choice at first, because you know, I think about false banks and I think about fossil fuel companies. I don't re- I didn't really think about insurance industries until the last two years where I started to get fr- messages about insurance companies not insuring their homes anymore. And I said, that's a that's a, that's a security threat for a lot of homeowners here in the United States. Thank you so much, Isaias. Uh, so yeah, I'm a campaign uh, manager. Uh, I'm focusing on climate finance issues, and I've been working at uh, the NGO ECO for six years. Uh, so just a few words on ECO, because yeah, maybe people don't really know my organization. So we're a global movement of over uh, 22 million consumers, workers, and investors working together uh, to push companies and governments to put people and planet over profits. So yeah, we have a lot of work <laughs> indeed uh, trying to uh, to do that. Um, I have you know a pretty grassroots activist background and uh, definitely I didn't plan at all uh, to take on financial giants uh, when thinking about my life plan, you know. Uh, so I started campaigning mostly on human rights issues and that led me uh, to investigate insure AXA, uh, if, you, yeah, if you know this major French insurer. Uh, so I investigated their investments in banks and companies uh, complicit in war crimes uh, in the illegal Israeli settlements. So that led me to do some financial research uh, to connect with organizations monitoring financial actors. And I completely discovered uh, financial actors' crucial role uh, in making any project happen. Uh, so yeah, that was my introduction to this world. And before that, I didn't know anything about that. I'm definitely not a financial expert. I really want you know to point that uh, out because you, we don't need to be financial expert, you know, to uh, understand and uh, yeah, have an influence, take action on, on, on all of that happening. Uh, so yeah, after the publication uh, of this report highlighting access complicity in war crimes uh, through this investment, uh, I was like, I need to do more and take on the root causes uh, of the issues. And my path <laughs> led me to uh, the Insure Future Coalition. So if you want to, I can say a few words on the Insure Future Coalition. Oh, you have a picture of our team. So yeah, the Insure Future is a global campaign of NGOs and social movements uh, that hold the insurance industry accountable for its role in the climate crisis. So basically we call our insurance companies uh, to immediately, one, stop insuring uh, new fossil fuels and second, phase out support for existing coal, oil and gas uh, projects. Uh, Yeah, simply because uh, to build a new fossil fuel project, companies need three things, the uh, permits, the money, and the insurance. So without insurance, uh, fossil fuel companies can absolutely not dig new coal mines, build tar sand uh, pipelines, uh, expand oil and gas uh, productions. So insurance, so this makes, you know, insurance definitely the Achilles heel. Uh, of the fossil fuel uh, industry. So except for a few laggards, uh, most insurers have stops 
uh, uh, have stopped uh, insuring new call projects under pressure from our campaign, uh, which is a major success of our campaign. Uh, but unfortunately, in contradiction of their own climate commitments, uh, most insurers continue to underwrite the expansion of uh, the oil and gas industry. Uh, yeah, so on this picture, uh, just a world. So as you can see, we're very small, <laughs> but we're uh, a nimble uh, team. Uh, we are all working for different organizations. Uh, so, so mine is ECHO, but we have so many more uh, uh, within this coalition. Uh, and we join together as activists and, you know, now friends uh, to conjugate uh, our efforts uh, on that. And uh, uh, this is also translating. Uh, so you've been maybe hearing about the Global Week of Action, Global Week of Action. So yeah, let me tell you just a few words uh, about the Global Week of Action. Uh, so uh, this week is put together by our It's Your Future Coalition. And uh, we are uh, going to have over 30 actions uh, in more than 20 countries during this week. So countries including Uganda, the UK, Korea, Colombia, Switzerland, uh, the US, uh, Japan, France, South Africa, Germany, Egypt, and so many more. And uh, yeah, the aim, so with your help, uh, we want to hold insurers accountable and help accelerate this shift away from fossil fuels uh, as you can see on this map, uh, you can organize an event with us or see what actions are already planned and join them. So the, 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 with your help, uh, we want to uh, replicate what we did for coal for the oil and gas expansions. Thanks to this you know, people's mobilization, coal is almost unanswerable, if we can say so. And uh, we want to do the same for the oil and ga gas uh, expansion. So insurers are, you know, very competitive and sensitive to reputational uh, reputational damage. Uh, so pitting the leaders versus laggards is a very good approach uh, for us. And uh, we've identified three strategic targets who deserve a big push uh, during this week and who we think have the most chance uh, of moving this year. So I will, we will go back to them, but just wanted to name them AIG, Zurich, and Tokyo Marine. These are the three major targets that we are going yeah, to, to organize action against during this week. Um, I maybe would like, tell me, Isaias, if maybe you have any question or anything, because I can't see the yeah. chat. So, no, I I love I love this. I I think I really like the analogy of first of all, like the connections of like fossil fuel projects, insurers, and they and fossil fuels projects need the insurance company. So it's like if you tackle one of the tentacles of the existing exploitative system, then you can stall or you know not allow that project to happen. One of the big biggest issues I think that um. I think for advocacy work and demanding action is that the general, let's say the general um, British citizen or the general American or the general European citizen or whoever is out there, they, they may not understand the climate crisis. And that's generally true in Americans here. We Americans, some of them don't believe in climate change, but what they care about is housing, medical and good paying jobs. So in the in, in interacting with the general individual to get them to care about why they should they should fight alongside to advocate for insurance companies to be held accountable, what what are those steps look like for just the person who just may not have any understanding for environmentalism? And I, I know that because I engage a lot with with a lot of older people who don't care about it, but they care about their house got destroyed twice already and they they have they've had to rebuild for the third time again. Yeah. Uh, so you, you're speaking about what kind of actions people can yeah. do at their, yeah, at their level. Definitely, that's what uh, I definitely want to, <laughs> to to discuss with you all uh, today. So why it's important uh, to take action? What can be the impact of the actions that we can take? Uh, so there there is a few objectives, you know, in taking action. So get your message heard. Uh, pressure the um, targets and stakeholders to take action, 
uh, reach the public opinion, so that can be done with protest and uh, other actions like that. It's also being part of this movement uh, building, you know, recognizing each other and showing that, okay, I'm not alone thinking that there is a major issue and wanted to take action on that. Uh, also to get media coverage, it's important to have our own agenda, you know, being reflected uh, in the media because media tend to reflect more the industry's agenda. So by this actions and mobilization is also a way to have this place, you know, uh, in, uh, in in the media. And so, so to raise also public awareness about the issue. What we are doing uh, in with our co coalition is trying to empower, you know, people uh, like you, me, to take to take action, and we can do that uh, in two different ways. I would say more offline actions, actions in real life, and digital actions. So there are uh, different impacts and you know results of doing that. For the offline actions, uh, the, the aim of doing that is to engage with workers, shareholders, to, to meet them, uh, actually. It's to be visible, to engage with the public. That's also a way to be um, surprising, like spread the word, you know, and raise this issue through completely unexpected uh, ways that can be, you know, artistic or ju just to, um, to, to make sure that our message is going to do the headlines uh, that can be to create also great pictures to get this media coverage. And uh, that can also be uh, physical uh, uh, actions that physically block the target's actions, like blocking the access to a building, uh, to a project, a road. So that can be also more engaging uh, actions uh, like this. Mm -hmm. And the aim of that is also to feel empowered by, uh, you know, joining uh, to together during these kind of actions. And, you know, for people who don't believe in the people power, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a lot of solutions and also wins in the collective organization. Can you name some of them and see like, what, what was it that happened? And what was the end result that came out of those campaigns? Yeah, that that's uh that's also yeah great for this slide uh so yeah i don't want to bother you with slide but sometimes having just a few uh can I, you know design materializing uh this wins can be important so people's power yeah people's power definitely works and uh what we've been succeeding so far so we are making new call power plants uninsurable uh, this is a major success as coal is the dirtiest, uh, the dirtiest of fuel. 45 insurance companies have introduced coal exist, exit or restriction policies, uh, which is huge. Uh, 26 companies have exit or restriction policies on tar sands, and 18 companies have exit or restriction policies on new oil and gas. And, you know, that's, Let's stay humble, but also taking the opportunity, you know, to brag a little bit. It's definitely thanks, you know, to people mobilization, front lines, communities mobilizing and organizations like Ins the Ensure Future Coalition, bringing people together, you know, to put the pressure on these actors. We can't expect the actors to move by themselves. <laughs> they definitely need people's push, you know, to, to do that. So that's, you know, just um, an overview, you know, of indeed the impact that we're having. And ju just one last thing on that has Hilda is uh, with, uh, with us um, uh, tonight. And she was speaking about the EECOP. So Hilda was definitely part of the uh, key uh, activists, you know, that helped um, having 28 global uh, insurers, you know, to rule out the EECOP, which is a major, you know, win. Uh, you have big projects like uh, the Adani coal mine in Australia, 
where now they they are seven years behind schedule because we are just you know uh, keeping uh, having you know insurers giving up on the project so i think it's been like 40 insurers so far giving up on the on the project and you have the Transmontane Pipeline, which is a tar sands uh, project on indigenous la lands in Canada. Yeah. And uh, so far, uh, they have they, they are like eighteen insurers uh, that uh, ruled out the the pi pipeline. So there is still an ongoing delay. You, we can block the project, which is very interesting as a tactic as well. Now, the the follow up question I have to this is that you know you mentioned that these some of these companies have said no to the existing new permits, so they will no longer per, um, permit new projects. Is is do you, have you ever seen a company violate that promise to the people, or is it usually implemented within their policy? So, like if a company is saying we're no longer going to do any new permits or policies, but then we're seeing other projects get approved, is that? a violation or a lawsuit for them or there is uh, this agreement more like a uh, to the general public like we we promise not to to build any new pro insure any new projects yeah so i have colleagues from the insure or future coalition that in this call that maybe can jump if they think about something but i was thinking that Sometimes the issue we have is that they are still insuring projects, you know, new projects, but they sign the contract before, uh, you know, uh, adopting their, their policy, which is very tricky because legally, you know, they are like, you know, we are just... Um, uh, you know, implementing the contract that we signed. Uh, so yeah, that's, you still have this tricky situation, but... Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, friends, but I think that when they adopt, you know, their, their policy, it's definitely binding, you know, and we're here also to remind them uh, very regularly, you know, to stick uh, to their to their commitments. But most of the time, they don't really dare uh, going uh, go, going back when uh, a strong policies, you know, I, I would say policies without loopholes, because this is the uh, yeah, it's another trick, you know, the fact to adopt a very empty uh, exclusion policy. So we are making sure that they're adopting meaningful exclusion policy. Thank you so much for that. I think that helps provide clarity and also um, how much Ensure Our Future Coalition is building out to ensure that they continue to maintain accountability, yeah. but also um, have you seen progress where companies have dropped existing permits that they've had for years? Uh, the, you know, is there a target for older permits? I know that newer permits is easier to said to be done because there's no investment money yet to be made. But older permits is where I think there's a lot of concerns where it's like, how do we get them to drop their their contracts they've had for decades, yeah. these industries? Yeah, we saw that, for example, with the projects I told you about, the IECO, the yeah. Adani uh, coal mine, the uh, TAL, um, TMX, the Transmontane uh, pipeline as well. Uh, you, yeah, you, you had insurers that were involved, you know, for years uh, on, on that. I'm just speaking about the Adani, um, the Adani mine, you know, they've been negotiated, you know, this contract for years, putting a lot of energy into that. And then, you know, people's mobilization and they have to give up about this, uh, this project. But uh, yeah, that's, that's something that's that's winnable, if that's maybe the question uh, behind, uh, you know, the answer behind your question. Yeah, it, we eat, um, it's not a big deal, you know, either they have been involved for years, you know, on a project or they are hesitating to sign a contract. I think that, of course, if we can just stop them, you know, uh, um, um, have this intervention uh, at this moment when before they sign, I think, of course, that's the best to put all the pressure at that moment. But we can make them divest uh, as well. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's it can it helps illustrate more the community power and collective effort that all of us have to be able to get these industries to divest, but that there is this continued momentum happening on there. So thank you so much again, Layla, for um giving us this information. And I know that a lot of you here are eager to probably if we go to the next slide to see um if there's a next slide on that end or the ending slide, but I did want to open it up for questions and answers. And we have such great questions right now in the Q&A box. If you're someone that's very interested um, in this, we're going to 
feel free to submit your Q&A. And also, please re think about registering for the Insure Our Future campaign, which will be linked by the team below. Um, you can get more information and resources on that end. So thank you so much. So I wanted to ask the first question um, on that end for, I believe it was Ben that asked the question. And maybe um, anyone can answer this from Hilda and Leila or Luis, is insurance companies are experts in risk. It's what they do. And moderate disruption premiums are going up and profits continue, but major disruptions will drive an existential crisis. So why are these industries getting it wrong? I, can I, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I think it's because they don't believe that the major disruptions will happen. I think it's very difficult for people to to grasp in any meaningful way how bad things can be and that bad things will actually happen. I mean, we have we, we see this a lot when we do sort of straightforward scenario planning work. Um, it's always very difficult to get people to to make the scenarios bad enough because, you, you know, there's the, oh, well, this would never happen. And sometimes the, oh, well, this would never happen means I've never seen it happen before. And other times it means oh my God, I really can't imagine that. I just can't stand it. I'm not going to think about it. Um, and I, I, you know, I think there was a, a another question. I think I'm picking up on some of the points that, that the um, other questioner um, mentioned, uh, Natalie Thomas, thanks for that question, it, is that it's actually quite difficult for people psychologically to really think about this bad stuff. So it's just so much easier not to. It's almost as if it's easier to imagine a different world, but in reality, recognize the truth of what's happening on the yeah. end. A lot yeah. of industry leaders, um, which I, I think, you know, this this actually leads into some of Natalie's questions and like kind of adding into that. Maybe Hilda, like, you know, in, in your region, like, you know, do you think that the global leaders are behaving unsustainably, not just for capitalism, but do you think that they're also scared about the future actions or peers actions that have caused that are unfolding this globally. Um, I know that, you know, I'm just speaking on myself as I, I think in America, we all, I think they all recognize the threat of the climate crisis, but I think right now we're politicizing climate crisis as controversial or we're banning ESG goals. And it's just very much, um, it's very sad to see that's happening here in America. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, the same thing is happening in Uganda. I think what well, what I've seen is that uh, our leaders or the people in these uh, companies or offices, the elder generation, think that uh, they probably won't be there to face the effects of their actions. So to them, it doesn't really uh, make sense uh, protecting the future. That's what I think because we had a meeting with the climate committee in Uganda and we were asking for accountability for the climate finance that comes in because we are a signatory to the IPCC. So we get climate finance every year. And uh, one of um, the representatives said that we can't think about the future without thinking about now, if we need the money now for something urgent, then we will definitely use the money for something right now so it shows that they don't really care about the future or the effects that will unfold after some time but they care about the now and i think they feel that they won't be there to face these effects and that's why uh, they are doing uh, uh, wh whatever they're doing right now yeah absolutely and I, and I think the 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 ways in which um you know, world. some of the world leaders and some of the industry leaders are behaving or behaving as I would say kids, they're behaving too, as if, you know, in some way they, they care about the planet, but they don't care about the actionable steps their company is doing. So they, they will say, yeah, like climate change is real, but you know, my industry is already committed to this by, we've already reduced our emissions. We have offsets. We are, um, you know, pushing this policy, we we said new to permits, but it almost seems as if like there there should be a continued momentum of constant evolution from these industries. It should not be that it's stagnant and it just remains 
um, on that end, just because we have to pressure them every time to to start to to drop these permits. And I think you know, um, one of, maybe this actually relates back to you, Luis, and maybe Layla too, is that you know within capitalism, the the ways that insurance companies are designed is right they center profit, and that's that's always been the case for a lot of businesses, but for climate risk and reputation risk, like, should we be building a system outside of that? Or like, how do, how do you see, and I know you talked about in your work, it's like, how do we redesign that system where we remove those profits and incentive and start to invest in our communities locally? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the trouble is that a lot of things aren't taken into account in, in the money side of things. So everything that the economists call externalities, like anything real world, just isn't taken into account. So the, the natural resources that people use and the, um, either use or um, use sort of by, by destroying, just somehow that all comes for free. Now, if people had to pay for all that stuff, that would be different. Um, you, you know, you could maybe translate that into money and, and the, the, the profit motive would, would come. But at the moment, you get people saying, well, gosh, yes, I mean, obviously the climate's important. Obviously biodiversity is important. Yes, yes, yes. And of course we should do something. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, you mean it's going to make life a bit inconvenient for me? Oh, uh, um, uh, oh, well, I didn't really mean it. And, you know, that's just not helpful, is it? It isn't. And I think that's where we kind of get to this endless loop of uh, conversations and debates with individuals. And that's kind of leads on to like, you know, industries that are trying to and maybe Layla, you can talk more about this is that, you know, AXA, one of the insurance industries, I believe, um, is uh, is ahead of the game. Um, someone said that they've seen their environmental policies. And, you know, there are still reasons we could criticize them. But, you know, do you do you think that they're doing enough or do you think like what, what what new policies would you specifically would like to see for the industry to evolve into because it shouldn't have to come from the community to demand them it should come from internal employee structures to say this is wrong we need to start building out for the future yeah uh you're, you're speaking about axa right yeah so, so yeah sorry with my <laughs> french stuff we we say AXA, I saw that I was a bit disturbed. Sorry, American did AXA. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, the, yeah, yeah, they, they, they are quiet leaders on some aspects, yeah, of, of that. And there are also internal discussions on either we should consider, you know, that they are leaders because it's like, you know, they are actually doing basic stuff. But amongst, you know, when we see the global pictures, yeah, they look like, you know, the outstanding students I, I would say but no, not really they still can do better but for the industry we are definitely asking uh, for uh, the uh, exclusions on uh, on call yeah having all the insurance company uh, doing this and uh, we want to have comprehensive complete exclusion of new oil um, and gas uh, on fossil fuel projects as well. But not only new, we are asking new to be, uh, th that's the first step, but they need to move away uh, from the fossil fuel industry in general, you know, invest uh, in uh, renewable uh, energies, uh, of course. And they also have... Um, uh, a responsibility. We didn't mention that uh, today, but uh, I think that's also the moment about loss and damages. Uh, you know, they are contributing to this, uh, you know, economy which is destroying, you know, entire uh, communities, landscape, and which is contributing to the catastrophic scenarios of having living in a world of maybe, you know, um, two, of two degrees. Uh, to Celsius uh, degrees more, you, you know. So they, there is also all the conversation about who should be also responsible, you know, to pay for all these damages. So insurers also have uh, a responsibility uh, in, into this. So that's my short answers <laughs> to, to this. But yeah, definitely comprehensive exclusions on all fossil fuels. Uh, um, on, on, fossil, on fossil fuels project and all fossil fuels 
and uh, yeah, investing in renewable. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I think it's so important that, you know, as we continue to shape these new industries on their end, but on the other hand, there was actually a great question here in the chat is what, what, and maybe, you know, Hilda, Luis, and Leila, I want you all to contribute this is like, how do we effectively talk to the people who work in the industry? So maybe we're not talking to the CEO, but we're talking to those that are in manager or director type roles. How, what, what have you seen that has been effective in your opinion of how to be taught? Because I think as a young person, anything disruption we're seen as annoying, a hindrance and disrespectful, and we're asked to, to leave the room. So how do you think we can effectively, what is your best way to effectively talking to them in your point of view? Um, we have different theories of change here uh, on the end. Should I? Uh, yeah, should I go for this one? Yeah, so, sorry. Maybe you mentioned someone else. I know everyone um, can go. I want everyone to just okay. comment. Yeah, I'm just going to give uh, you uh, a few stuff, and you know, people can also uh, comment and contribute as well. Uh, so yeah, one thing, you know, the the top thing is like you're. We are speaking to human human beings, you know, to, to people, because yeah, most of the time we, it's so easy to see, you know, the company, the big villain and uh, having also this kind of dehumanization as they are doing, you know, with us, with the impacted communities as well. They are literally dehumanizing us. Uh, so that's great to not assume that the staff, you know, they, they know what's happening in their companies. So for example, when we organize, you know, digital actions, uh, we um, adapt uh, our discourse, you know, our narrative to the people, to uh, the, the workers, just first to inform them what their company is doing. Because you don't have to forget that inside the company, you know, the, 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 the leaders, uh, they are always saying, oh, we are the best, we are doing this and that. And the staff just can believe them, you know, they can really sincerely believe that they're on the right side. I see you say, doing that, Louise, because I think that you are meeting and speaking with these people. So yeah, they, they think that they're on the right side, uh, you know, so there is a kind of pedagogy to do, you know, with uh, uh, the, the, the staff uh, as well, and not going like fighting, uh, you know, with them, but engaging the conversation, showing um, uh, some, you know, documentation and things like that. And we have some, so digital action we can do by sending emails, you know, for, for example, directly to them, to informing them, we can target them with the LinkedIn ads, you know, on some, uh, on, on some stuff uh, as well. Uh, we can go um, during AGMs, and you know, just giving flyers, exchanging with uh, with them, and that can be surprising, you know, sometimes to yeah become friends with shareholders and having shareholders, you know, joining us and like yeah, I would like to do something, I would like to change, uh, yeah, I want to do good. So I don't think that you have people. You might have, of course, but uh, I I'm thinking more globally for the staff the walkers they're doing like oh i'm going to walk and i'm going to destroy the world i and i don't give a you know of doing that all day you know i can picture you know a lot of people doing that in these companies so we just have yeah to speak to just you know human beings and explain so they are not going to all become whistleblowers you know we are not expecting that but they can nudge you know inside the corporation as well and we don't have to minimize the role of having their awareness inside and their action uh, inside so that was developing this part i let my other friends speaking if they want to about that I, I, I think um, I basically what, what Leila said, absolutely right. I think it's also important to try and not not criticize them as people, not not say you are you personally are doing the wrong thing because that's that's very threatening and, and really sets people against you. You want them to be on your side. So um, you know you, it, it's ways of getting them think thinking, for themselves without saying, and by the way, you are working for this company that is killing people or whatever, because I don't, I mean, which is, may well be true, but I, it probably isn't helpful in, in that context. 
Yeah, I, I love that point of view. And Hilda, Hilda, I would love your point of view too from like a young climate activist perspective because I know that um, I approach too, like, and this is kind of related to Natalie, I think Natalie Thomas's question too. It's like, um, I try my best to promote education instead of interrogation immediately. And I use this tactic a lot with older people because I think too, like if I don't know them, I need to understand where what their moral compass of values holds in the spectrum. And so I think for me, that's how I approach things first of being like, let me see what their views are on life first. Um, but Hilda, I would love for your thoughts, specifically like the work that you continue to do and how, how also um, dangerous it is for young activists to do this work. Okay. Uh, thank you. So for, for me, I would advise uh, storytelling. Uh, storytelling in the way that if these employees hear or read about a story from, for example, a, a girl from a frontline community uh, that is being affected by the activities of the company, so maybe they can think about their work differently because they're seeing evidence and it's not that someone is telling them direct in the face that uh, they, they are doing wrong or what they're doing is not good. So I would advise storytelling. Um, that is one of the tactics we used with a stop eco. We uh, mobilized, we, we were four climate activists from Uganda, from the front line, and we went on sharing our stories with different, different banks, institutions, organizations, and uh, it really helped them understand uh, the point that we are trying to communicate and how our communities are affected, how the world will be affected. And of course, uh, with some research, uh, it, it was able to help them understand that it's not only the frontline communities that are affected, but also the world at large will be affected or their country will be affected in one way or the other. So that's, that would be my advice. Yeah, I love the storytelling aspect because I think storytelling is a tool of creativity. The, the, our societies are, bitch, are built on cultural foundations. And I think that's really what holds people together is, is stories, not so much data and facts while they are super important and that they are uses storytelling too i think the the heart of what it comes from the community and this kind of ties back hilda back to the question here in the chat for you is that despite of the fact that most insurance banks and government um pay payers i believe or prayers um gave up on eacop um in uganda and tanzania why is it that you think that it's become a huge elephant um for climate activists globally i think to me, it, it seems to me that the storytelling is what helped make it such a large campaign. I agree, I agree. Storytelling has been such a very important tool where the victims themselves share their story and what they're experiencing on the front lines. Uh, but also I think because of international solidarity many people have understood where we come from where our fight roots uh, because of sharing the story so they can connect to the campaign or to the fight and that's why uh, many people have been joining this topic of campaign because it's visible but also because um, it has a radical approach where they directly reach out to uh, or expose the company that is uh, doing wrong for example to tell energies uh, we have been uh, uh, very radical in, in, in our campaign, reaching out to Total, telling them about what they're doing and how they're doing it, how it's affecting people, you know, there's no way they can, oh, this is not right. So this uh, has also been oh, one of um, the things. And... Uh, I think we are at a time when the the effects of climate change are getting extreme and awareness is increasing. Uh, many people have their eyes on the climate. It's
Oh, Hilda, I think we may have lost you. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yep. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. No, so I, I was saying we are at a time when um, the world is starting to realize that climate change is real and it's a priority. It's affecting everyone. And also many international organizations are coming up to speak against it, such as the IEA, uh, which say that there should be no um, new oil and uh, or gas or coal projects for us to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is, of course, research that scientists have been saying for a while, but many people haven't uh, been understanding. But uh, due to the youth uh, climate movement, it has helped people understand uh, climate change better. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And yes, I, I agree. I think that the EACOP has similarities to how stop willow project here uh in the u.s and how it was being presented i think the storytelling was one of the large components kind of like the lng project that i helped participate in raising awareness against and i think um the the pressure though specifically on those corporations was so unique in the way that eocop was doing it um, from different strategies but i think the radical um approach on there um on that end but i think you know within insider industries um you know uh, Luis, this is actually a really great question that someone asked is, you know, how different are actuaries to other parts of the insurance industry? And do you think they can be effectively mobilized to dis to disrupt from within a broad from within on a broad scale on the end? Um, I think actuaries are exactly like everybody else in that they vary hugely, that there are some actuaries who are um really on board and really understand all 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 you know climate crisis and sustainability and so on and there's a lot of actuaries doing some very good work on that um and there are other actuaries who say don't bother me with that just let me get on with my day job um so there's the whole um there's the the, the whole range um i think that i found that even some of the more committed people actually there are limits to what they'll do so they're doing some great work um ilana's just posting some links in the chat now um there, there was some fantastic work done on climate scenarios and and how the ones that are widely used especially the ngfs ones are well i think if i say completely useless i'm actually not being quite fair but i mean basically not not that good um but when it comes to asking them to actually speak out, they're less willing to do so because they feel that um, they, their jobs might be threatened. They feel some of them are actually doing sort of work from within, from within the sustainability teams in insurers. And they have, have managed to get some change, some small change. And they think that by speaking out, in favor of much more drastic change that they'll kind of look that they'll lose credibility basically they want to be seen they they a lot of actuaries in particular feel that the way they can have influence is to be seen as sort of fairly dispassionate independent rational experts who aren't taking sides so as soon as they they're worried then about speaking out and trying to um, argue for change and so on, because then they'll be worried that they'll be seen as as lobbyists and that they won't seem as credible. So it's quite a fine balance that many of them are trying to strike. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for, for that, because, you know, it, it kind of ties in deeper. And this is actually what we just talked about recently about um, the insurance industry is being held by law. Um, you know, there was a recent case, I think a few a year few years ago, where a fossil fuel a fossil fuel firm was suing its insurer for refusing to cover a climate lawsuit. And I'm actually interested, have you seen whether it's been the public that has sued an insurance industry or a fossil fuel industry and sue the sue the insurer for not wanting to insure them? Have have you seen unique cases like that in in where you're based from um on that end or other things that you've seen? No, I'm I'm afraid I I don't have direct experience of that at all. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, thank you for that. I think this is a question um, now for the whole panelists here. I'm just trying to locate this. Is that um, what is one thing that you'd like for people to 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 leave this panel remembering? I think I want to would love for Layla to speak on this first, and then we'll go to Hilda and then Luis. Um, I think that like it's really important for all of us to take key key actions and steps around what needs to be done because I think all of us here collectively like have an understanding of what needs to be done. But I think realistically, when it's applied to real practice, that's where we where industries themselves um, can be a little bit slower than than ever before. Yeah, there are, there are many questions in one question, is I yes, <laughs> you're trapping me. Uh, so yeah, one thing I, I hope that I um I succeeded you know in sharing with you today is hope definitely hope you know and trying to empower empowering uh, you uh, as well showing that there is no little action you know and that's definitely the sum of all the this different actions that we are taking that can make a huge difference. I really hope that, that by sharing some of the impact of, of the wins uh, that we got, you, you saw the picture earlier during this call, uh, we are less than 20 per persons, you know, in this coalition, uh, working on this campaign, you know, uh, and you, you have, of course, um, locally all uh, the communities, the frontline uh, communities, you know, fighting the, the, the project and us, you know, the, 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 our team is just trying to coordinate everything, strategizing. But if we only rely on people's actions, you know, people's power, people's taking action, you know, to really, really have an impact because it's not just the 20 person here, you know, doing something, we can only be impactful thanks to you taking action. And this Global Week of Action, I, if I could conclude you know, on, on that, is definitely a great opportunity to target all the different stakeholders uh, you know, uh, within the insurance industry. So Ilana is going to share with you uh, some links and you'll have the opportunity to take action as you can, according to you know your your level of engagement and what you are ready to do, and that can be calling the staff, you know, have this human discussion with the, with them, sending emails, going on Twitter, and doing yes some brand shaming because sometimes they deserve that they deserve they deserve that we call them publicly, you know. So yeah, you have all this range of different actions that you can easily take you know even from home thank you Layla um Hilda um do you have any key takeaways that you would love to leave for the the people here yes um, definitely one thing is uh what I in my work is mobilizing people and the power of the people is stronger than the people in power. So the more we mobilize, the more we uh, get numbers is how powerful and how strong our message will be. And uh, maybe one last thing is that silence is not an option in the face of an injustice. We are facing an injustice. We need to speak up against this injustice. We need to expose it so that we can find a solution together. Yeah, thank you. And Louise? Yeah, thank you, Hilda. That's so right. Remember that insurers are important, that they do have a huge influence, that they do play this pivotal role in much of our economic activity. So they can't get away with just saying, oh, we're just little insurers, we don't matter. Either, either they do matter, in which case they should be doing something, or they don't matter, in which case, why does anybody bother with them in the first place? Absolutely. I think that, you know, my my takeaways is that, you know, continue engaging in these conversations and also like any any anyone you can target, like if you have friends or family or people who have um, that are stakeholders, like, you know, they have large 
power um, on that end to decide things, but also um, to help push local policies for those who are in the United States. There's a lot of initiatives that are being pushed from different organizations and collectives that are trying to hold um, industries accountable. Of course, that's going to take time, but I think those these are really key ways to help introduce it through a systemic uh, systemic law of help, helping that on that end. And I think that there's another maybe slight question on that end. Um, I think I wanted to ask more too with extending ourselves beyond the environmental movement, because I think, you know, um, how do you think we can engage, actually, actually, how can we engage the the different groups and movements, but also the environmental movement that's not really identifying how the insurance industry is also a very crucial lever to fight against climate change. Because I think, um, you know, when we hear about new projects being developed, that it's being financed by this fossil fuel industry and blah, blah, blah. But then we don't understand that there's a lot of um, key partners and key people that help push that. So how do you think we can mobilize the best ways we can talk to them and um on that end so maybe we'll start off with uh Layla again first on that end sorry I couldn't unmute um so yeah you're you you're th thinking about more grassroots uh activists is that making the the, the connections between yeah, yeah the the di all different groups. Yeah, th this is what we are doing uh, yeah, with the Insure Future Coalition. It's uh, just trying to build, uh, you know, ties, bridges between what we are doing. And just, I'm always reminding how I was thinking, you know, before knowing anything, uh, having any connection with the insurance world, you know, just reminding that for me, it wasn't a thing before until I was introduced to to that so i would say that first step you know is having um yeah uh for events like this one uh and um yeah the global week of action it's an opportunity uh, you know so to put pressure concrete pressure on these targets to make them act but also to uh, make our movement or mobilization known you know from the I would say activist mood, movement, but the general public, uh, you know, as well. And yeah, for example, uh, Isaias, we didn't know each other before this event, you know. So that's a way we connected together. I didn't know Louise uh, as well. And uh, we are reaching out to more and more groups and people are connecting the dots, you know, and definitely see the points in targeting insurance they really understand that it's coming to the tackling you know the, the the issue at the at the roots and it makes sense just one conversation is often enough you know to convince uh, our comrades you know to join or at least to have some more specific actions you know targeting the insurance most of the time, it makes sense to target the banks. And now people are more and more coming to targeting the insurance. Knowing that with targeting the insurance, there is kind of this kind of more moral obligation, you know, on the insurance side that you don't really feel or have uh, on the bank's uh, side, which makes them more vulnerable, I would say, you know, targets uh, for the, for the activists uh, as well. So, yeah. Short answer after all of that is maybe just, you know, just connecting all together and yeah, just reaching out and uh, trying to have more public events uh, like that. So, so, so people can see the point of mobilizing uh, against insurers. Thank you so much, Leila. And Hilda, what about yourself? Sorry, you were breaking. Can you pardon? Yes, um, yes. Let me repeat the question. So how do you think we can um, further extend the education and actions about the insurance industries to the environmental movement who often really, not struggles, I would say, but often maybe isn't as well as educated enough on the insurance industry? Yeah, I think through uh, organizing training, so uh, webinars like this to help them understand uh, 
understand the insurance, sorry, the role of insurance in combating climate change and also so that they uh, understand what they as environmental activists and uh, also to mobilize other people in their movements. And of course, inviting them for events like this, um, like the Global Week of Action, them being part of it really um, increases their awareness uh, about insurance and um, organizing spaces such as Twitter spaces or X spaces can also have them engage. Thank you so much, Hilda and Luis. Um, I I would say, yeah, like, how do you think we can get, um, yeah, intergenerational movements to to continue to learn about this? This is not my area of expertise. You know, I'm I I don't have a background in activism. I I come from the insurance side of things. Um, I'm also an older generation person. Um, I I'm into. I, just treat people as people. I love that. Especially, I mean, this is an intergenerational panel, I would say. I mean, we have different people who are younger, mid thirties, thirties, forties, fifties, like, you know, we have such a unique, diverse um, people here. And I think I really like the human aspect of like humanize before we speak. And I think that's going to help us in the long, in the long game for a lot of conversations, of course, too. Um, to help us build a stronger community too of like there are there will be people who don't know anything and once they become educated that are the general citizen they'll they'll take action with us so I think that's really powerful on that end but with that being said I think this does put an end wrap to our wonderful panel about ensure our future I definitely wanted to um, thank all the panelists here that gave their time to be here and all the audience members who tuned in I did want to maybe um, send it over to maybe um, Layla from Ensure Our Future, no, sorry, not Layla, um, Alana or anyone from the team that wants to talk more about the campaign. But this is the final call to action is that if you are really invested in this uh, webinar, you'll get a recording of it and please sign up for Ensure Our Future. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you, Isaiah, for amazing moderating and to Hilda and Louise and Layla for being brilliant panelists. And also thank you to everyone who showed up, whatever time of day it is or night it is for you. Um, we really appreciate your time and your energy and everything that you're bringing to this campaign and to the Global Week of Action. So there's loads happening in the chats uh, throughout this event, and I've dropped a lot of links to things in there, but the chat can be overwhelming. So I'm also going to gather all those links and we will just share the recording and share the links of where you can find everything that's been discussed in your own time without having to run through it all now. Um, but most important, we would love to direct you to the Global Week of Action webpage, um, which is in the chat multiple times. But if anyone has it to hand to drop it in one more time, that would be great. And the webpage has a map for what is happening near you. There's actions happening. Um, across the world. So hopefully there's something near you, but there's also great digital actions that Layla spoke about. So even if there's nothing physical near you, you can definitely get involved. And it also has information on our communications pack, actions pack, and how to sign up for more. So please do stay in touch with us. Um, we really appreciate everything. And together we can win this fight that we cannot afford to lose. So thank you all, and I wish you a really wonderful rest of your days or evenings. Thank you. Bye. Bye.